Is that candy or flowers? <laughs> what are we doing about candy? The online one? Okay. Good morning. Uh, before we begin, we have a beautiful prelude from Craig. I just have a few announcements. Today is the deadline to place your uh, Easter flower order. You'll want to give that to Flo, um, typical hyacinths and lilies, and then we'll use those to decorate the altar. But um, if you weren't prepared to do that today, you can also call Flo later or email her later and um, take care of that though. That's uh, a deadline that um, Greenhouse would like to have an idea of how many we're gonna need. Also, just want to remind you, sometimes we get in a zone and we forget we have two needs here at Fairhaven that are part of our community outreach. The little pantry right outside the church, just want to remind you, every time that you are buying for yourself, if you could get a couple extra non-perishable items and get in the habit of every time you come to Fairhaven to put something in the pantry because it is utilized in a big way. It's, um, it's emptied almost every day. So uh, you just have to get in the mindset of uh, remembering. That's the hardest part, remembering. And then our clothing closet, same thing applies there. We have a closet right outside the back of the kitchen door there where people can help themselves to socks, shoes, sweaters, whatever you have. And I know that um, all of us in this sanctuary are blessed people, are we not? So I'm sure you have maybe a shirt you haven't worn in five years. I'm sure you have a coat that doesn't fit as well because you've gained the COVID-15, right? <laughs> but if you could go through your closets and uh, maybe next time when you come to church, fold them and put them on the shelf in the closet. Um, I know I had an abundance um, of extra portable umbrellas and I put them in there and they're all gone. Uh, last week I put some socks in there. So just wanna remind you as Fairhaven folks to come each Sunday with something either for the pantry or the clothes closet. Okay, Dylan, you're gonna lead us in the call to worship. Yes, I will. Um, and one more announcement real quick. Um, this was just announced on Tuesday. Um, as you may know, the Pittsburgh district was in the process of finding a new district superintendent um, who will begin July 1st. They have made their selection this week and it's going to be the Reverend Deb Ackley Killian, um, who I believe many of you know, um, and we're very excited to have her. She'll be starting at the beginning of July. That's awesome. 
Yeah, very good news, very good news. Okay, the Lord be with you. Everybody rise? Um, sure, let's do that. Okay. So today we're going to try something a little bit different. Um, our theme for the day, um, again and again, is again and again we're called to listen. Um, and this is part of our invitation to not only speak, pray, sing in church, but we're listening to God. So for just a moment, as we prepare for worship, I invite you to join me in this kind of different call to worship, um, just embodying this prayer as, as I go along here. So let us listen and pray. I invite you to close your eyes. Rest your feet on the floor beneath you. Release any tension that you're holding in your jaw, neck, shoulders, hands, legs, feet, and take a breath and then let it out. The Hebrew word for breath, I say this a lot, I think, is the same for spirit. It's the same word in Hebrew. Breath and spirit, life, it's all the same thing. So as you breathe, imagine that it's God who's filling up your lungs with energy, with love, and trust that God is as close to us now as your breath is to you. Now still your mind and imagine it, you know, like a river. All the thoughts that come, they pass by. Instead of holding them onto them, let them float by as we prepare for worship of God. As you quiet your mind, listen deeply, listen far out, listen widely. The sound of your breath is the closeness of God to us. And in this space, the holiness of God is present. Let us worship God now. You may be seated. I believe we had uh, some announcements up there about Bible study and the Lenten devotion. Uh, if you're not aware of that, Tuesday nights at 7, um, you can join on a prayer call that for this particular time of Lent, uh, Dylan and Diane will be doing that each Tuesday night at 7. And it's really only about a 30-minute I yeah, we're think, keeping it to half an hour. Yeah, it's just a half an hour, so you can squeeze that in. And then, of course, our Wednesday night Bible study continues via Zoom, mm -hmm. correct? And that's at 7 on Wednesdays. And if you're unsure of um, how to get involved with the Zoom process, you want to see the Smoyers, they can help you with that. Okay, our opening prayer. Join with me. Creator God, we cannot hear the trees growing, seeds pushing up through the dirt into the sun, and we cannot hear a single drop of rain, missing one in the many. We cannot hear the weight of people's grief, a burden that so often is silent, and we cannot hear when hearts are changed, but you can. You hear it all. So once again, we come to you with bowed heads and hopeful hearts, asking that you would lend us your ears. Help us to hear as you hear, so that we can live as you lived. We are listening. Amen. Now, our hymn of praise, uh, unfortunately, we are still not allowing singing, but that doesn't mean you can't tap your feet and hum. <laughs> it is number 534, Be Still My Soul. <laughs>
listen as I read Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. As we approach God and seek to have him listen to us and seek to listen, um, to what he is saying to us. We confess our sins before God. So I invite you to take a moment to silently pray personal confession before we pray together. Listening God, take what is closed in us and open it. Take what is distracted in us and settle it. Take what is hurting in us and hold it. Take any and all parts of us that create distance from you. For we are like Peter, O God. We argue what we don't know. We fear what we cannot see, and we almost always speak sooner than we listen. So open us, settle us, hold us, and forgive us. We long to hear you more clearly. We long to know you more fully, And with hope we pray, with gratitude we confess. Amen. Siblings in Christ, we confess with gratitude because we know that God has already heard and forgiven us. No matter what we have done or left undone, we are held in God's hand. So rest in this good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, um, what is it that we have to lift before God and one another in prayer? I'd like a prayer for my uh, great niece. Uh, Her name is Gia. She's uh, she's 11 years old, but she's having some uh, thyroid and heart Mm -hmm. problems. She's not young, so I'd like to have a prayer for her. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what their names are by any chance? No, it's, it's okay. I saw that story as well, so. Okay. Yes, Betty. Yes. Jim Igham's mother. Um, passed away on Monday, is that right, Jim? Wednesday. Wednesday. Um, So continue to lift the Igham's family up in prayer as well. Yes, Betty? And for Claire, she's having severe shoulder problems. Okay.
for James Grant, I know is, is having some pretty significant lung problems. Um, maybe pneumonia, maybe COVID aftermath, they're not really sure. Um, so prayers for James, he's not having a good time right now. Yeah, Flo. Anything else? Okay, then let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are even quicker to listen than we are to speak. And we can lift up with confidence all of those people and situations, places you have put on our hearts. Your spirit speaks to us, O oh God, by putting those names in our hearts. Your spirit speaks to us each day as we go about our lives and see people in need. Help us to hear it ever more strongly each day, that we may hold others in our prayers, in our hearts, and also that we may reach out with your love wherever is possible. Help our thoughts to become prayers and help our prayers to become actions. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We lift up all of those who have been mentioned today. Um, those who are in need of your compassion, your comfort, your healing. James Grant and Gia. The family that is dealing with the loss of their father and this young girl struggling for her life in the midst of the sledding accident. We lift up Claire as she has some problems with her shoulder. And we lift up Jim and June Anderson um, as they begin to return to something like normalcy after, after COVID. We lift up Jim and the entire Igams family. That their mother may be always a blessing to them, that she may be held close in their hearts, that the gift that she has been from God will never be forgotten. Help each of them to inherit her legacy, um, to carry her with them wherever they go. At the same time, we lift up all of those things that are great joys. Um, just as you hear our struggles, you hear our joys, and you celebrate with us. Um, that Flo finally got to see her grandchildren. That so many around us, even as the speed feels to be slow, that so many around us are beginning to become vaccinated and life, hopefully, is returning to normal on the other side of the horizon. Bring this pandemic to a quick close, oh God, and we thank you for the health that you have given us, even as we mourn all those who are lost, and hold those who are grieving close to us. Thank you for supporting and upholding your church through this all, that we can be the light of Christ even in the midst of a time of great darkness. Help us even in this darkness to keep our eyes peeled and help us to listen, to hear where you are calling us to go, to see where you are leading us, that we may come out from this pandemic um, stronger, 
more compassionate and better serving you than ever before. We thank you that you have called us to be your disciples, and we ask that you strengthen us in our faith each and every day. And we can be strong in faith in you, our Father, because we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from the New Revised Standard Version. The Old Testament reading is the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. And now from the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 8. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Pray with me, please. Dear God, help us 
in the hearing of your word. Not just to hear it, but to listen, to inwardly accept it, to be changed by your word. Grant that the words that I speak may come from you, and that all of us will listen to whatever it is you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a certain type of person, um, and I'm sure you've met him or her at some point in your life, because they're not all that rare, um, who just tells it like it is. You know, that's the way they put it. No politeness or or sugarcoating, they'll say. They're just going to come out and tell you what they think. Maybe brutal honesty is the description they use. Some people like to be brutally honest. Um, My experience with that, to be perfectly honest, is that I find it's oftentimes a cover to be a jerk without worrying about it. (laughs) <laughs> and cloaking it with honesty as, as the label. Um, you know, kind of like how someone will say, with all due respect, before saying something that isn't remotely respectful, as if that makes it okay, you know. You're going to listen to what that person has to say, whether you want to or not, whether it's helpful or not. That's one kind of honesty. Um, it's an honesty about a personal feeling without, you know, really worrying about other people around you. But an alternative approach to honesty, meanwhile, is to be the kind of opposite end of the spectrum there. Um, To be overly concerned with people's reactions um, to such a degree that real truth, not even personal opinion really, can fully break through because you just don't want to rock the boat to an uncomfortable degree. You have to listen really closely with someone like that if you want to hear needed and important truth because otherwise you're not going to hear it at all. It's... But this is the kind of feedback we mostly prefer though, right? I mean, that's better than brutal honesty because the truth can hurt. Jesus in our gospel today sets a completely different example than either of those two things. He's not just swinging his fist around, his fist of truth here, and he's not just um, avoiding potentially offending people either. He speaks clearly, plainly, and honestly. He never holds back to keep the peace. Jesus isn't into that. But he also never just speaks carelessly either. And he makes it very obvious how we're supposed to respond. We're called to listen to what Jesus says. With our ears, our hearts open to the good and to the bad. And listening, in turn, is supposed to lead to a response. You know, you can hear something and it can just bounce off. But listening implies there's some kind of internalizing going on here. It's like whenever Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, we talked about this scripture a few weeks back, was teaching in the synagogue. And um, Mark writes that he wasn't, right, he wasn't teaching as a scribe or a teacher does, but as one with authority. He's not just speaking for the sake of speaking. He's not just telling truth so we can take it or leave it. He's telling us with the expectation that it will affect our hearts and our actions. Words of truth, as hard as they are, are a source of grace. If Jesus is telling us something, no matter how it feels, it's a source of grace that he's telling us, that he's giving us the opportunity to respond to it. We've talked about this a lot for those of you who have been in the Revelation Bible study. Um, The words that John is portraying to all of these churches that he's writing to, um, that Jesus is speaking through John, they're harsh, but he's telling them it all because he's giving them the opportunity to be better. As we read this text today, I can't imagine what it would have been like to stand in Peter's shoes, Peter in this story. He's always this eager disciple. He's eager to act, eager to please. But because he's so bold and ready, he often puts himself in difficult decisions that the other disciples are able to avoid by just like standing back and keeping quiet. You know, generally speaking, probably most of the other disciples are thinking what Peter's speaking, but Peter's the only one who will say it out loud. And his boldness is just a blessing and a curse. Just before where we began reading today, the beginning of Mark chapter 8, Peter is the first disciple to acknowledge out loud what we as readers of the Gospels have known all along. And that's that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Just a few verses from where we began today, Peter says, you are the Christ. Other people have said maybe Jesus is the return of Elijah or John the Baptist, who's recently been um, imprisoned or executed. Maybe he's one of the ancient prophets come back, but Peter knows, and Peter's willing to say it. Jesus is the Messiah. 
he finally gets it eight chapters into Mark, as presumably the rest of the disciples do, because they heard him say it out loud, or so we think. Because it turns out that Peter is only mostly right. Because Jesus immediately begins talking about how he's going to undergo rejection, suffering, even death before rising again. And Peter literally grabs a hold of Jesus and tells him to stop talking like that. Jesus doesn't hold back. He's not just going to accept Peter telling him what to do. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, he says, but human thoughts. Peter is right that Jesus is the Messiah, but he's imposed his idea on what that means. The people of Israel at this time are expecting a military liberator. They're going to purge the Roman forces from Israel, um, and someone's going to take, the Messiah is going to take King David's, King David's throne once again by force. Israel's going to get a king again. They're going to be a strong nation again. They're going to be great. And obviously you can't do that if you're going to die. Peter's upset that Jesus is saying what's going to happen to him because it completely contradicts his expectation of what a Messiah is going to do. But Peter doesn't understand what kind of Messiah Jesus is, and Peter refuses to let Jesus explain it for himself. That's maybe one of the scariest possibilities of encountering truth from God, of listening to God, is that there's the possibility that we could be rebuked and taken down a notch, even if we're mostly right. You know, best case scenario, we're mostly right, that's pretty good, but that still comes with the possibility of being corrected. It's extremely humbling, and it's no small matter either. I mean, whenever Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, that's hard stuff. And Jesus is telling us there that Satan himself is the source of lies, of confusion, and anything else that stands in the way of God's plan. Anyone who stands in the way of God's plan is a tool of Satan here, whether they know it or not. Satan corrupts the mind and the soul, fills us with pride and self-confidence and our own power and righteousness, and fills us with our vision of who God is and who we're called to be. Our drive, as this text says, is to gain the whole world, even at the cost of our life, of our soul. But truth, and we see this right here, in almost any circumstance, is most likely going to humble the proud, like Peter here, and Raise up the poor and the weak. That's what the word of God, Jesus Christ, does. And so a word from God is going to do that as well. The real truth, the real honest truth is the cross, which is going to turn the world upside down. Notice that's how Jesus follows up immediately after rebuking Peter here. He says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, let them take up their crosses, and follow me. The cross that is the source of death and sorrow and oppression somehow becomes a door to life, liberation, salvation. In the same way, what Peter's experiencing here, the truth that stings, the truth that puts us in our place, is somehow also the truth that sets us free. Listening to God is pretty likely to torpedo our boldest plans. It's likely to take a hammer to our instinctive desires because we'd never choose the cross for ourselves. Who chooses to pick up a cross? Something that's not ever going to end well. But God tells us the truth because he loves us. He calls us to die to ourselves and be raised in Christ. I wonder sometimes, and I've had this thought a lot over the past month or two, if it might be a good rule of thumb that if we get a strong inclination in prayer that is just completely out of left field from what we would normally think and desire and want, I wonder if that could be God speaking, if that's likely to be God speaking, particularly if it cuts through our most deeply held prejudices, desires, things that we want. The Word of God, by the way, doesn't come only explicitly from Scripture or as an audible voice from heaven. I mean, I wish we got that all the time, this audible voice like Peter. Not that I want to hear Jesus say, get behind me, Satan, but it'd be nice to get some clear direction sometimes. The Methodist way of thinking about revelation from God is that we affirm that Scripture comes first every time, but we also recognize that God speaks through our religious tradition and the church, 
our God-given reason. I mean, use your brain in thinking about the world. God gives us that too. As well as our experience of God's saving work within us and around us. And I think we know at some point in our lives that it's not altogether uncommon for the Spirit to speak to us through other people. I mean, if the image of Christ is in other people, surely Christ can speak through other people too. And I wonder what uncomfortable truths we've refused to listen to out of pride, out of a misplaced sense of rightness. Because listening is an, inherent, an inherently humble act because it implies active openness. You can hear and believe the whole time that you have no intention of listening to what someone's going to say. You can hear and use that time as time to just wait and formulate a response. But listening is not just hearing, it's hearing and then internalizing and then responding, not just out of reaction, but actually affected by whatever's said. Weighing it honestly, seeking to hear as that other person is moving us and as the Spirit is moving us. Listening, as Peter is kind of forced to do here, is taking the first step towards picking up our cross. It's humbling ourselves before another person who has something to say and who sees truth in a way that we might not have been able to see it ourselves. That alone right there, even just listening, assuming you don't change anything at all, is a Christ-like surrendering of power and pride. We move from being the Peter who interrupts Christ with our own ideas to being a disciple who sits back, waiting to learn, willing to learn, even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable. You can hear maybe what we're doing that's harmful, what's causing people pain that we might not even know about. We can hear what truth we might simply not be in a place to experience it. I mean, there's plenty of things that I couldn't possibly understand because I've never experienced them. And maybe the level of sting that we experience, given a hard truth, will correlate with how badly we need to hear it. I mean, get behind me, Satan, is about as intense of a rejection as Peter can get, but maybe that's just how important it was for him to shed that righteousness and get the truth. And I think that this is true with countless issues that we face today, countless issues that we face in daily life. I mean, you know it in family life. I mean, how hard it, how hard it is to hear um, the experience of someone else just in your own household and change what you're doing because of it. People in different places than most of us are just trying to get the world to listen right now about the racism the black and brown people face as they live their lives. You know, LGBTQ people are crying out for respect and dignity. And just listening, just that little step of listening, not even changing, but listening with a soft and an open heart. As hard as it can be, that's taking up our cross. And of course, we're called to speak the truth that we've heard as well through Christ, through the Spirit, through other people. And if we've truly listened and been moved by the Spirit, our actions and our words are likely to change. The good news that we've received is never to be kept to ourselves. I mean, that's not the purpose of the gospel. The gospel goes out. And speaking the truth we hear from God may well threaten our positions, our respectability, the way other people respond to us. And believe me, anytime I dare say the word racism or LGBTQ from a pulpit, believe me that I feel that weight and feel that stutter every time. But we see in scripture that there's a paradoxical reward for faithful listening and responding. Listening and changing to become more like Christ is picking up a cross upon which our old sinful selves are crucified every single day. But there's also always a reward. Somehow for losing our lives, we will save our lives too. For taking a risk and following Christ, Jesus says, the Son of Man will welcome us proudly when he comes in the Father's glory with all the angels. This might be the ultimate example of what Lent is supposed to be for us. We're taking up our cross, knowing full well that the reward we're going to get might be on the other side of the tomb. Abraham was never going to see these multitudes and generations that came after him. But that was well down the line. The promise of God is that reward comes in the future. 
self-giving, self-surrender, even unto death if that's what it requires of us. I mean, that's the logical outcome of the cross, right? You don't carry a cross so you can put it down later. You carry the cross up the hill to be crucified. That somehow is the only way to achieve true life. Thanks be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that he shows us the way that he puts Satan behind him and the cross before him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's affirm our faith now um, in this God who calls us to truth with these true words of the Apostles' Creed. If you'll rise, please. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we have been, um, the offering plate is available on your way out. Um, and for those of you who are watching online, as always, you're welcome to mail it. Um, Susan Magyar has been very faithful about getting the offering and taking care of all the finances, even that come by mail. Um, and we're grateful for that, grateful for your giving, um, for your gifts, for your service, and just your presence in prayer or in person here. Um, I'll also tell you on your way out, um, the offering plate's back there and on the little podium beside Bill. There's um, booklets for the Again and Again devotional, which is what we're using on Tuesday nights. Um, we had a small crowd, but we really enjoyed it last Tuesday. Um, it's a beautiful book. I mean, for the artwork alone that is based on the scriptures, well, there's like 20 back there, so I'd urge you to pick one up on your way out. Even if you're not going to come on Tuesdays, feel free to read it yourself. But let's join together now in this offering prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the covenant you established with Abraham and Sarah which you have opened to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept these offerings with the dedication of our lives that we may be for the world a sign of your abiding love and a testament to your enduring promise. In Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Doxology. <laughs> Amen. Receive this benediction. Go forth in the world. Here, what's that? There is. Another hymn? Oh, I was wrong. Craig was right and I was wrong. Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's very rare. <laughs> Four, this is number 451, Be Thou My Vision. It's not exactly about listening, but it's close enough.
as you go forth in this place today. Um, may the word of Christ lead you into the world. May the word of Christ be on the lips of all those that you meet, and may the Spirit move with you throughout this week and throughout your lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.